focus on the hazards or we can focus on the resilience of the things that are affected by the hazards. So let me briefly talk about the first approach, but concentrate more on the second approach. So if we are focusing on the hazards, we have to focus on differences because different hazards will have different features. Of course, the infrastructure that it affects are similar, but you have to focus on the different hazards. At the same time, you can focus on some similarities because the approach to dealing with hazards involves similar ideas. For example, you need to have hazard zones. Uh, you need to see whether natural mitigation can be utilized. You can see whether no build regulations have to be imposed. And for each one of them, say, for example, you need to see whether proper guidelines for non-engineered buildings have been um, uh, presented or have been developed. Now, these are, for example, some of the things that we did when I was chairing a subcommittee at the Disaster Management Center. So we tried to get some of these zonings, update some of the wind speed zonings for the country, and also try to develop some earthquake zonings for the country. So whether it is an earthquake or whether it is a cyclone, we need to have zoning. Then also, these are some of the definitions of different hazard zones. So once again, we have high hazard, medium, low and no hazard. And we can define different geographical areas of the country. For example, where coastal floods are concerned, it will mostly have to do with distance from the coast. Where things like cyclones and high winds and landslides are concerned, they will be defined in different ways. So we can see that when we are dealing with hazards, when we are focusing on the hazards, it is useful to use templates like this. Now, this is another template that was developed. So, for example, these are mostly for buildings. For each of these different types of hazards, we can try to see whether the features that are desirable, whether they are just recommended or whether they are in fact mandatory. That is the kind of approach that we can use when we are looking at hazards. So we look at the different hazards, but we try to deal with all of them in a similar way in the sense that we make sure every aspect is covered for all of these hazards. Now, when we focus on resilience, it's a bit different. Now, this word resilience, of course, is used in many contexts, in ecosystems, where social resilience is concerned, economic resilience, which we are thinking about right now during COVID, and of course, resilience against natural disasters. But the word resilience actually has a structural mechanics root. Resilience, as was used in the early 19th century by the people who were developing structural mechanics, had to do with the area under the stress-strain curve the amount of energy that can be absorbed. Now, these are some things that I have done in the past about it, where I argue actually that we should think more about toughness because when a material is ductile, it can absorb energy even in this plastic region in this way. Now, what we are trying to do, what I'm going to present is a structural mechanics analogy that will help us to define and perhaps even quantify resilience. Now, Structures are resilient if they are redundant, meaning they have more members than they need. If they are well formed, meaning that if their loads can be shared roughly equally between the members, and if they are ductile, meaning once it reaches its maximum load carrying capacity, it does not fail suddenly but maintains the load and any increasing load can be shed on to other members that are close by. So, uh, interestingly, when the World Economic Forum looked at a much wider set of systems, economic, environmental, governance, etc., they used the same words, almost the same words, to define what the characteristics of resilience were. Robustness, redundancy, and resourcefulness, which is uh, similar to what I call ductility. And this is about resilience performance that is the response to a disaster and also the recovery from the disaster. But what we are trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to take these ideas, robustness, redundancy and ductility, 
and broaden its application. So when we are talking about the resilience, which I'm going to concentrate now of infrastructures, we must make sure that infrastructure is well shared. We must make sure that infrastructure has extra capacity to deal with some uh, uh, certain uh, demands on it. And we must make sure that infrastructure is able to adapt to um, unforeseen uh, situations. So resilience is made up of these three components. And so, for example, you can use these ideas to plan some kind of uh, resilience audit. So you can do it at a building level, a city level, a country level, but at each of, and for these different components from infrastructure to geopolitical. But for each one of those, we need to see are the robustness components okay, good sharing, are the redundant components okay, alternatives, and is the ductility also okay, ability to cope when situations are a bit different or, or there is a greater demand than normal. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but you can actually uh, calculate the energy under these curves, use this structural mechanics uh, analogy. This has already been published elsewhere. And then you can try to estimate the different energy absorbing capacities for these different configurations. So this is a trade off between redundancy and ductility. We can see that even though the redundancy is low, you can have high energy uh, absorbing capacities if the ductility is high and vice versa here, low ductility, high redundancy also means that you can have high energy absorption. If you have both, of course, you have very high energy absorption capacity, right? Now, this is a, uh, an example of that's paired out in some infrastructure in Kuala Lumpur. Now, this uh, tunnel that you can see is actually a road tunnel but it is called a stormwater management and road tunnel, smart tunnel. So when there is no storm, it is only the vehicles that use this tunnel. Occasionally, maybe once a year during the rainy period, you have some heavy uh, uh, rainwater that has to be conveyed and that can be conveyed under this kind of, in this drain that is under this roadways like this. But if you have maybe a once in 50 year storm or something like that, then you have to close this tunnel to traffic and then you have to use it only for the water. So you can see that this is an expression of ductility. The tunnel behaves in a particular way under normal loads. But when the loads are exceeded, say this is the normal load, water load. But when the load is exceeded, then it behaves in a different way. Of course, some inconvenience uh, caused. But the important thing is you do not need to build two tunnels, one for the rainwater, one for the vehicles. You can manage with one component. So you are trading off redundancy. You do not have redundancy because you have this ductile way of behavior, ability to adapt. Now, this is just north of where I live. So if I want to go into Colombo on a morning, a weekday morning, uh, I have to go through a situation where there are three lanes of traffic going northbound like this. And this lane is on the other side of this center island as well. That is because for rush hour traffic, one side of the road is not enough. So here you find that this road is behaving in a ductile manner. It is behaving differently when there is rush hour. Southbound, there is only one lane in this direction. So if you look at the map here, you find that here from this Dehiwala Junction up to uh, just near this Dehiwala Bridge, you have only one road that can take you into Colombo. And that gets overcrowded. So in those situations, we need to have the infrastructure behaving in a ductile manner. Once you pass this, of course, there is both this marine drive as well as what we call this gold road that can take you into Colombo. So there are no three lanes of traffic here. So here there is redundancy, here there is ductility, you can interchange these and if you are planning infrastructure, you need to take these kinds of things into account. Now, if you think on a bigger scale where the roads in Sri Lanka are concerned, now here this is the coastal road severely damaged during the 2004 tsunami. It is impossible to defend this kind of this road against that kind of event. Fortunately, we had already planned a southern expressway like this. So this is another road that connects uh, the, the capital city 
to the south of the country and it must be appreciated that this southwest quadrant and these coastal areas in the southwest quadrant are, are where the most of the development in the country has taken place and that needs to be well connected to the capital city of Colombo. So, based on what I was talking about earlier, we can even come up with some kind of resilience scale that goes from 1 to 8. Now, this work is continuing. I have a student who is working on it. These are some very preliminary results and I have not even checked his work. But we can come up with the resilience index between 1 and 8 for different cities in this kind of way with respect to infrastructure resilience, environmental resilience and social resilience. As you can see, Colombo doesn't do, do too well here. Maybe it's too crowded. Which brings me on to my next slide. Colombo is very, very big. So if you think about Colombo and the rest of the cities, and if you draw a graph between the log of rank, now this is number one, two, three, four, five, like this, and the log of population in those cities, then you get a curve that is concave upwards. So which means that this is dominating severely. Now, if you look at India, it's actually convex upwards in this kind of way, right? So India has many cities that can, in a sense, uh, uh, so they don't have all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. Now, you can look at this in a different way as well. So this is when you have the biggest city, the next biggest, actually the next biggest, the Hibala Mount Lavinia, is not really a separate city. It is... Uh, connected to Colombo, it is actually greater Colombo. Now, what we can do is, now there is this thing called Ziff's law, which says that if you take the log of rank and the log of population, or, or the, you know, this can be many other uh, entities like this, then it should fall on a straight line. Now, what I have done is try to plot this on a straight line without plotting rank number one, right? So when you plot it like this, this is the indication of where rank number one should fall. But actually, rank number one, Colombo, its logarithm of population takes it up here. So I can calculate something called a degree of primacy. And it is, you know, this is called a primate city. Colombo is a primate city. If you take Colombo and suburbs together, degree of the together, the degree of primacy increases to 4.6 from 1.9. So you can see we have stored all our eggs in this one basket of Colombo. Now, is that good? Can we think of alternatives? So let me uh, let me try to uh, explain this in a different way. Uh, okay. So if you think about Colombo like this, you can think that, okay, we have had many disturbances in our country, many problems in our country. Now, those problems have had many reasons, socio-cultural, socio-ethnic, you can call all of them, right? And they have various, various reasons, maybe uh, an economic reason, maybe some kind of uh, ethnic uh, uh, reason. But another way of thinking about it is that all of these problems arose in areas that are furthest away from the city of Colombo. What if Colombo, the capital city, was situated somewhere close to the center of the country? Also, we have to make, we, we understand that Colombo is a coastal city, subject to things like close to coastal flooding, tsunamis, and various things like that. There is also a nuclear reactor at the tip of India somewhere like this. It may be good to think about an alternative city, a second big city, perhaps. Now, this is just speculation, just putting out some ideas somewhere near the center of the country. How do we found, find out where that is? Well, I want to have a small diversion here, also connected to resilience. It's to do with connectedness. And we can use some of Newman's theories to find out what the most connected link is. Now, if you think about this kind of system, we can do the calculations and find that this link, 3 to 5, is the most connected in this network. If you break this, then you are uh, doing the most damage to this network. Now, you can do that to things like, you know, structural assemblies like this. Most people, when they design trusses, they only think about the stress and whether the members have enough strength to carry that stress. But here, this is a way of looking at connectedness as well. 
So we would argue that this trust is better than this trust because the members that are most connected, um, uh, you, you know, are the ones that are inside, inside like this, right? Whereas here, if you lose this member, you have, you have lost a, a, a cord member and that will considerably weaken the trust. Now you can apply this to a road network as well. And if you do this to, the Sri, Lanka, to Sri Lanka's road network, the most connected road network, road uh, link is the A6 and A9 overlap at Dambul. That means every, most of the traffic in the country, the greatest amount of traffic in the country, not traffic so much as, as the route, in order to get from one place to another, will tend to pass this overlapping roads. So this is the area. So this is the, uh, uh, this is the, a6 that is going in this direction and this is the a9 that is going in this direction and this is the stretch that uh, we are talking about right so the idea is that if this is the one that is most connected to most parts of the country could we not have a capital city here we look at the national uh, physical planning department's metro areas and we find that one metro area is somewhere here as well we find a paper by Professor Madhuma Bandara in 1992. Of course, he is, I think, proposing Anuradhapura as a capital city. This area that I'm suggesting, Dambulla, is not too far away. Of course, I do not have any clear plans, but I'm saying that we can use some of these ideas about resilience and robustness and connectedness to think about the way that, you know, we, we, we think about national resilience over the next uh, 20 or 30 years. So let me conclude. There are two ways to think about resilience, like I said. One is to focus on the hazard. And in that, a very useful thing to do is to have templates to make sure that you deal with every hazard in a similar way so that you fill in all the gaps and don't leave anything um, uh, un unturned. Uh, do, 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 don't forget anything. The other way is to focus on resilience, where you do not think so much about individual hazards, but you think about the entire system the entire infrastructure, the entire country, is there robustness, is there redundancy, is there ductility? Ductility is a very important concept. It behaves in one way during normal situations. It is able to adapt and behave in a different way when there are unforeseen loads or, or, or stress or, 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 or demand on that situation. And seeking trade-offs between redundancy and ductility and also explore connectivity for insight. So I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. So meanwhile, I would like to ask you about the the zoning and then the like, it is very interesting the discussions uh, like I mean, uh, so how about the other hazard zoning would would make an impact to the this proposed uh, uh, argument of uh, uh, changing the uh, the capital from colombo to uh, to somewhere else yeah okay sorry uh, in the presentation I, I i i talked about changing the capital city uh, maybe i should not have said that but in the slides <laughs> i have said something about a new big city new big that city i mean yeah. new big city yeah. right uh, separate from Colombo because as it is Colombo is growing larger and larger and, and you know it is just urban spread whereas geographically that may not be the best thing right so okay so you you are trying to say you know if this city that we are proposing we should also think about the hazard zones and not only things like road connectivity you you are you are, you are very correct yes uh, that also has to be taken into consideration maybe I should have done that but actually, I think an area like Damulla probably is okay because I think it misses the cyclone belt, yeah. which goes probably north of it. Yeah. And uh, of course, it is off the coast, so that means there are no coastal hazards. I'm not sure how it squares with the earthquake map, but actually speaking, 
there isn't very much difference in earthquake uh, acceleration throughout the country. But certainly, thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so the yeah, other question would be from my side, like there is a historical uh, uh, history history behind this uh, development of the capitals. I guess like the uh, the near uh, the being uh, near to the coast coastline and then approached by the overseas uh, like through the ports and uh, like the transport of goods and services maybe. So how yeah. what what would happen to that like uh, from like when you are connecting via uh, uh, from the over other countries? So yeah. what like. Yeah, so, so yeah, once again, a good question. So that's why I said maybe what I said was slightly misleading in referring it to as a capital city, right? Now, there are other people who are proposing that we should have, uh, you know, many smaller cities being developed, right? So maybe, you know, this megapolis ministry at one time, I think that was also part of their plan to, you know, enhance, you know, the, the urban environments in not only in Colombo and the Western province, but in other parts as well, right? So I respect that and I respect the urban planners who talk about developing smaller towns. I'm just wondering whether to make an impact, whether you need to have really another large city because, uh, you know, otherwise there's a lot of urban drift into Colombo, a lot of urban drift. So if we can have two cities, uh, I mean, it's, it's just sort of a provocative idea. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you could argue that the country is too small to have two large cities. But I, I would certainly like to put this uh, out there for discussion for people yeah. to think about it and engage with it. Yeah. Uh, I always like when I, when I even I meet you in person. Like I really like how you trying to integrate these uh, concepts of structural engineering into the disaster risk management, and then to uh, m like it's like kind of broadening the knowledge uh, knowledge base, and then also like. Uh, thinking like challenging us to think uh, uh, think more about these things rather than looking into this uh, con conventional thinking of uh, uh, the ha hazards and and then uh, exposure and in this this uh, conventional uh, th theories of disaster risk management so there are several questions from the uh, uh, from the uh, the participants in the uh, from the zoom uh, so the one quick question what would be have you tested the robustness and connectivity for the early warning system in Sri Lanka? Uh, right. I think there has been some work done on this. I have not done any work on this. Uh, I think uh, our chairman uh, of this particular panel has done something on social network analysis, I think, yeah. or something. I think so that would have something to do with connectivity. Yeah. So I'm aware that some work has been done. I have not directly been responsible for it, but yes. Uh, so, you know, what I'm proposing also ties in, in a sense, to the idea of connectivity. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, the second question is, uh, uh, in, in an era of uh, cascading dis disasters, what is your take on dynamic resilience and how new innovations, uh, innovative tools can be used to re redress it? Yes, okay. So, I mean, here also there has been some work done on it. I, I do not claim that I have been part of it. But, you know, you know, so we are talking about uh, basically what I would understand by your question is that, you know, we have uh, certain, you know, values, if you want, for, you know, robustness, redundancy and, uh, and ductility. And those numbers will change, you know, through the cascading disasters. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I am not sure about, you know, what the best tools are, but I, I think there's a lot of development uh, that would be required. Thank you for the question. Great question. Yes. Uh, so the question number three is like very interesting question, sir. Like the, the number, uh, the other question is how to seek a, a trade-off between redundancy and ductility. Please explain. Yes. I can see that the same person has asked what is the way to explore ductility. So I will answer both of those questions if that's okay. Yeah. So I think that smart tunnel in Malaysia, I, I haven't actually seen it, right? It's been written up. So I'm taking the information from what's being written up. Um, so uh, I think that's a good example. And, uh, you know, I have seen a few examples of it elsewhere in the world. Also, mostly to do with floodwaters, actually, right? Mostly to do with floodwaters. So, you know, the floodwaters occur only, only occasionally, right? 
and uh, you know we need to be able to use some of those areas for other types of activities which of course we need to be suspended you know when your 25 or 50 year flood comes along right so that tunnel is one example of that mm. i tried to give a few other examples in my talk also like you know just the way that the traffic is uh, controlled in rasha but you know just uh, close to my house you know people are moving it so that you know you don't you don't need to then build another road i mean you know you you can use just a single road hmm. uh, but you can use it in a different way during rush hour and during uh, and, and during the normal traffic yeah so this has to do with reducing the costs of infrastructure because countries are finding it increasingly difficult to find money to put up the infrastructure so the idea is to use it in a better way i hope that uh, question and i hope that answer is okay yeah. right uh so there is another question uh when we when are we going to have uh, resilient cities uh, resilient cities do you think that we are as a country somewhat backward in terms of new technology and innovative think um, thinking in terms of robustness redundancy and ductility so what do you think about that well i mean uh, the thing is you know sometimes uh, you know these things happen in a sense almost uh, uh, almost by accident i mean you know without uh, thinking about it i mean okay just the example of once again that road that is used with three lanes going northbound and one going southbound in the morning so because of the exigency of that situation uh, you know people i mean the people the traffic police probably thought of uh, doing it in that way right so then you know when we take steps in situations we need to see uh, you know what have we learned from this experience is this a positive experience and can we translate this experience to other areas completely different areas but conceptually see it as an example of ductility i i, I think that's what we need to do and uh, uh, now I, i mean i haven't said anything about covid 19 but there are a lot of things that have uh, you know occurred due to covid 19 and i think we can say okay what are the you know robustness redundancy and resilience uh, and uh, uh, ductility examples we have learned from it and see whether we can replicate some of those things in other areas also so i mean i am using this structural mechanics analogy and you know my sort of theoretical position is that it can help us to analyze many situations so that's the position i am taking I'm, i'm sure there are shortcomings in that framework but i think it's a reasonable framework for exploration yes yes sir, i think we are uh, like almost uh, running out of time so one last question sir in embedding these resilience characteristics what do you think what do you see as the main barriers in in sri lanka like em- embedding these resilience characteristics maybe into policy planning and decision making i would yes. say yes uh yeah i mean uh, i i i don't know i mean uh, i think we need to have uh, you know some kind of evidence based uh, analysis evidence based research maybe you know if these interventions are done some kind of uh, analysis of how uh, uh, good or otherwise they are uh, sometimes perhaps uh, you know now just like this conference is trying to do sort of links between what is coming out of universities because universities are always thinking about <laughs> funny ideas right like yeah. the one that i presented just now i mean you know so most uh, university people will think about uh, you know things like that because you know they need to uh, focus yeah. on originality yeah. but some of those things may be useful and therefore you know planning ministries and people like that need to have their eyes and ears open and you know link up with ideas coming out of university so i think this conference is doing a great job yeah yeah so thank you very much sir. and then uh, as you correctly said it is like always it is very important to mainstreaming these uh, things and embedding them into the uh, like planning and uh, decision making also i guess so then as you said uh, it is always very important for uh, the scientists and then the practitioners and then the policy makers coming together and have a open honest dialogue Uh, sir is there any concluding remarks from your side uh, before we conclude the session uh, no i mean i think uh, i mean i i would like to do, uh, you know think about what i said basically and see whether i mean I, it would be great to see whether there are, if there are any other examples about uh, you know uh, how this you know has been implemented or whatever uh, i will stop there thank you
thank you very much sir and please continue your uh, thinking and then please keep please pushing us to do better uh, and with that uh, we are go we are concluding the final keynote and then we will be moving into the technical sessions and thank you very much professor priyan dias from university of moratua for his keynote speech thank you very much